What about pro-social behaviors? Let's see if we can sort of upswing this into more positive things. Now, with pro-social behaviors, this is all kinds of ways of working together with others. Um, first of these, we'll call it cooperation, which is behavior by two or more individuals that leads to mutual benefit. So with cooperation, you're both going to be doing something together and you both get something out of it. So if we look at group projects, which will come up later on because there's a whole bunch of qualities of group projects that are socially describable. But cooperation within a group project means that you both do the work and you both get the grade at the end. The more you each put into it, the more you each get out of it. So cooperation is something that's beneficial in this case. If it was set up in such a way that maybe you have a really driven partner and you don't have to put in a lot of effort, but you still get that good output, that might be reason to maybe do some social loafing. You let somebody else carry your weight, um, but that's not usually tolerated very well. Um, and that term will come up way more later on. But if we're saying that you're cooperating, we're specifically saying that you're both putting in and getting something out of that cooperate, uh, cooperative system. Um, another one though is altruism, because people of course look at behaviors and they're like, wait a sec, some people will help others, but they don't actually get anything out of it. So this is a behavior where one individual is aiding another with no apparent benefit for this action. And once again, from that evolutionary perspective, people looking outside of human behavior, they were actually sort of almost mind blown when they start seeing altruistic acts in non-human animals. Um, I love using corvids as an example, uh, crows and magpies and ravens all fall under that umbrella, and they show a lot of social uh, behaviors. So they'll help each other out. They'll share food. Um, you'll actually find that um, there's a nest of ravens on campus. They tend to mate for life and they live like 40, 50 years. So they're kind of in it long term. But they nest over on one of these sort of arts humanities buildings. Um, and they've been there for at least a decade from my experience but their kids stick around. Their offspring will hang out and help them raise the next generation. Um, and there's a lot of ideas of, well, why would they do that? They could go off into their own territory and they could raise their own offspring. Um, from an evolutionary perspective, they're losing out on the potential to pass on their genes. So what the heck is going on here? Why are they cooperating? Or if we see food sharing behavior, why the heck are they sharing food that they worked really hard to get? So altruism, um, doing something at a cost to yourself without a benefit to benefit someone else really goes against all those evolutionary perspectives. So we'll actually end up talking about some special ways of explaining altruism, but we're going to stick with cooperation first because that one at least makes sense on paper. So if we're both getting something out of it, it does make sense to cooperate. But of course, there are always risks. I've already mentioned group projects are a big one for this. There is a reason why I have only one class that involves group projects and the grades are completely independent of one another. I have it right down the middle where one person does this part and the other does that part because social loafing is real. Um, but that's one of our risks to cooperation where people might not uh, sort of contribute equally. So people might not cooperate at all. They might cooperate in a lesser way. Um, it's especially if there's a chance for them to still get something out of it, even if they don't help, that makes them even more likely to put less effort in. And again, this tells us, well, maybe there's something uh, evolutionary that goes against this, because if we have people who don't cooperate, it's actually probably just easier to do it yourself. Now you're not dragging someone else's weight. So why do we see so much cooperation in people? And there's a whole subset of research that looks into this, and it actually ends up overlapping with a bunch of sort of socioeconomic theories. Um, but you might have heard of the prisoner's dilemma or even the ultimatum game and a modification called the dictator's game. But these are different ways of modeling. Um, so it falls under the umbrella, I believe, of game theory. But it's like, what is the most effective? What is the most beneficial choice for this individual? What action would they make if they were behaving optimally in this system? So it'll make sense as we work through some of these examples. But if we start with our prisoner's dilemma. Now we have two prisoners and we'll put them in sort of separate um, interrogation rooms. They're isolated from each other and you offer them a deal. Um, we tell them that if they both 
cooperate. If they turn on each other, then they're going to end up getting a short prison sentence. They're still going to be punished, but it's not sort of the worst. We tell them that if one of them cooperates and the other does not, the one that cooperated gets to go free. And the one that does not is going to end up getting sent to jail and they'll serve both terms. So they're going to get extra punished. Um, and if they both defect, if they both don't help, um, they're both going to go to jail for some indeterminate amount of time. So in this case, now we have a risk where if I want sort of this best case scenario where I want to receive either the shorter jail sentence or I want to make sure that I don't go to jail, um, you might say, okay, I'm not going to say, or I'm going to sort of tell you um, what's going on. I'm going to um, turn on my compatriot. Um, but then you have to run into it of, oh, oh no, if we both said something um, that's going to give us a different response and so on and so forth. So you can actually work all of it out. And what we end up finding is that if you want sort of the optimal strategy for the individual, if we're looking at just one person, they're actually a lot more better off to be selfish. So it's better for them to try and protect themselves than it is to try and protect their friend. So they shouldn't sort of keep themselves quiet to not incriminate the other person because it's actually more likely to backfire on them. And if we sort of look at the um, sort of calculations behind it, the logical thing is to just focus on yourself. So be selfish, don't cooperate. Um, if it helps. Um, I have sort of the visual that goes along with this. I tend not to do great with the just word explanations as we've seen, um, but here we have two criminals, we have Tucker and we have you, um, and you have to decide. So uh, does Tucker cooperate? Do you cooperate? Um, that's what you'd have, have happen. If they cooperate and you don't, um, then you go free and they get a longer sentence. And if you both don't cooperate, you get some intermediate. Um, so that might help visualizing. But again, in this case, we should see that you are selfish, that you should um, sort of try and protect yourself, that you're not going to protect the other person. Um, but of course, in this case, it doesn't quite work. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. This wasn't really devised by prisoners. It's just meant to sort of imitate a situation prisoners might face. Um, and they would say, you know, we should always pick this option but people tend to cooperate and tend to protect the other person far more than we would predict. And of course, we run into the issue of, well, why the heck would we do that? Why would we sort of risk ourselves for someone else? And one of the reasons they've come up with is in a lot of these cases, you don't just bring in your participant and ask them one question, make one decision, and then send them on their way. What often happens is you have them come in make decisions, see the outcome, and then go through it a few more times. And in this case, you're ending up with sort of a history and you learn, should we trust Tucker or not? Well, he's been trustworthy in the past. I'm more likely to trust him now. And actually one of the strategies that ends up being the best long-term is something called the tit for tat theory, which might be on, a, or tit for tat approach, which might be on the next slide, but we'll see. Um, but it's basically, I will match what you've done to me in the past. So oftentimes you start cooperative, you start optimistic, and if they turn on you, then you're going to go scorched earth. You're never trusting them again. But um, if they cooperate with you, if you've had a positive interaction, you're more likely to continue matching that positive reaction. So you tend to, um, in subsequent interactions, follow what they've done in the past. Um, so that's something that we'll end up talking about um, in terms of reciprocity, matching what's been given to you previously. And of course, there are other game theory options. One is called the ultimatum game. This is a really cool one. Basically, they'll sit you down and they'll say, uh, you're going to get something. We'll use the example of $10. So you have a proposer, the person who's dividing up this money, and you have your responder, the person who's going to decide, are we accepting this deal or not? So the proposer is going to offer a split of $10. And you could say anything from, I'm keeping all $10 for myself and I want to give you nothing, or I'm going to give you $5, I'm keeping $5, or I'm giving you all $10, I'm getting nothing. Now, of course, we want to get as close to I get everything as possible. Um, and the responder is going to want as much as they can get, but you think of it where the baseline is the responder starts with nothing. 
So if we give them a split, we say, I'm keeping $9 and I'm giving you $1, they're still $1 richer. They're better off than they were before. And if they reject your deal, they get nothing. So they could, out of spite, say, I don't accept this split and neither of you get anything. But if we just went with this from a game theory perspective, getting $1 is better than getting no money, regardless of what the other person receives. So we would anticipate that sort of, um, you should accept this. And we don't see that. People tend to be fairly spiteful. Um, but also if we frame it from the uh, uh, proposer side of things, where people should try and keep as much money for themselves as possible, that nine to one split should hold, um, people tend to go a lot closer to an even split. They will be a little bit more selfish than they will be generous, but it's still not trying to keep everything for themselves. So if we look at sort of our distribution here, um, this is looking at sort of offers versus rejections. Um, basically, when will the, or the um, responder say no? Um, but our offers tend to be that split, that even split. Um, we're more likely to offer them less than the $5, but most often they will stick right in the middle and that tends to be accepted. Um, people will tend to reject it when you get into like sort of lower amounts. But in this one study, they didn't even have any of the, um, the proposers um, propose that nine to one split. They didn't go that unfair, they stuck right in the middle. So this goes against what optimal behavior theory would tell us, um, they end up going sort of a more equal and cooperative route. So again, we're seeing people tend to cooperate, maybe even if they shouldn't. And then the last one of these is the dictator's game. And in this case, it's the same as our ultimatum game, but now our responder has zero say in the split. So basically the dictator completely dictates what happens. So we have our $10 and I can tell you, I'm keeping 10, you get nothing. And that's what happens. You have no say in this, I get to choose. So again, optimal performance would say, you keep it all for yourself. So it would say you offer nothing. And if we look at what actually happens, um, we do see more people that give nothing, but we still see people that do an even split. So our people making these decisions are behaving a lot more cooperatively a lot more sort of selflessly than we would have predicted. And of course, we then say, well, why the heck are we behaving this way? Um, and if you're curious, I stuck them all on the same slide just to show sort of our ultimatum versus the dictator. Um, the double blind dictator is a really cool modification where basically instead of you having to sit there and see each other make the decisions, um, they have you do it by closed ballot. Basically, you can put money into envelopes and nobody knows what's happened. Um, and as soon as you give them anonymity, people are there, therefore much more selfish. So this tells us there's probably something about sort of social aspect of what's expected and the fact that you're supposed to be fair and equal, but if you can get away with it, you're more likely to be selfish, which is just really cool to see. And another really cool thing is if you look at this ultimatum game across cultures, we start seeing some interesting patterns here. Now, this is a really gross graph to look at, but if we have our sizes of these little circles, the larger the circle, the more people are offering that split. And the smaller they are, the fewer people that offer that split. And then at the bottom, we're saying, so here it's a percentage. So if we were looking at our 10, um, that would be over here and zero would be over here. So again, the optimal should be that you give them nothing, but, different cultures are going to show more splits, where some of them are actually going to see people that give all the money to the other person, which is really neat to see. Um, and if you start looking at where some of these are uh, in, around the world, we start seeing once again, that division between individualistic and collectivist cultures. And we've mentioned this before, but just our refresher, individualistic cultures are gonna be like North America where we are focused on ourselves. Um, and when we were looking at our self-identity, our self-identity would be about who I am. I'm smart, I'm strong, I'm good at this. But in a collectivist culture, so places like, um, I think India falls under this umbrella and Japan, I believe. Um, but those cultures are a lot more about the group. And the idea is you succeed if your uh, community succeeds. 
So when you ask them about their self-identity, they talk about how they relate to others. Oh, I'm a parent. I'm a brother. I'm uh, somebody who does this in my community. In those cases, it's a lot more sort of outward focused. And those collectivist cultures, because of that mentality, are a lot more likely to share that wealth. So they'd be a lot more likely to have an even split or even give more money to the other person, whereas individualistic cultures are a lot more likely to find a selfish option for it. Um, so yeah, just an interesting thing to look at. And you don't need to know the specifics of any of these countries or anything like that. Um, actually, these might just be cities, um, but we care about the pattern and the fact that what kind of environment, what kind of culture you've grown up in can actually influence your view of what is expected, what should happen. Now, I did say that um, altruism and true altruism of doing something, expecting nothing in return, goes against a lot of our evolutionary perspectives. People don't like it. They wanted to explain it in a way that makes sense. So they have two main approaches. The first is kin selection theory, which basically says that you are more likely to help the uh, people that you share more genes with. So you'd be a lot more likely to help your sister than your third cousin. Um, and if we look at not just humans, but other species, this actually tends to hold very often. So if we look at the example of meerkats, they live in large uh, eusocial colonies and they tend to um, have alarm calls. So if they see a predator coming, one of them will stand up at the top of a hill and they will alarm call to warn everybody else to head underground. Of course, you standing out in the open screaming that there's a predator is pretty likely to draw a predator. So why the heck would you do that? You're putting yourself at risk and other people are benefiting. Well, oftentimes they're more likely to alarm call if close family members are nearby. Whereas if they don't have a lot of relatives in that area, they're more likely to stay silent. So that supports our kin selection theory. Our reciprocal altruism theory is really cool. That's where that reciprocation comes in. And this is where you're basically saying, I will pay you back. I'm gonna help you now with the expectation that you will help me in the future. Corvids are big on this one. And it's usually seen in more sort of uh, social and intelligent animals. Basically, you need to live in groups where you have repeated interactions with the same individuals. So if I've shared food with Sally and she's shared food in return, I'm more likely to keep sharing food. But if everybody knows that Frank is going to steal from your cash and never share, you stop hiding food when Frank is around. So you learn from past experience to cooperate with those who cooperate in return. Um, and again, very common in more of our social species. And then of course, cultural influences, if we wanna go more human focused, we've mentioned that norm of reciprocity perhaps, but the norm of reciprocity basically says that we feel obligated to help others when they've helped us. So if somebody does you a favor, even if it's a small favor, you now feel obligated to return that favor. So if you come to class one day and uh, you borrow a pencil from somebody and the next day they're like, actually, can I have a copy of your cheat sheet for the exam? You kind of feel more obligated to share it because they've done something for you. Whereas if the first time you meet them, they ask for your notes, you're like, I don't know you, no, not at all. But if you have a rapport, you're more likely to return it. Uh, the norm of social responsibility is something where we feel an obligation to help others, especially if it contributes to society's welfare. So if you see somebody stranded on the side of the road, you might feel obligated to go and help them out because that's the good thing to do. That's the correct thing to do, the expected thing to do. Uh, socialization is another thing that has an effect here. We can tie it back into modeling, but basically, we're a lot more likely to help others if that is what we see other people doing. So if we're taught to relate to other people, especially if we tie in empathy, so putting yourself in someone else's shoes. So with kids, trying to teach them not to steal toys from someone else, you might say something like, well, how would you feel if they stole a toy from you? That makes them a lot more likely to share moving forward, at least once they can make that connection with that theory of mind we've mentioned before. This is called our empathy altruism hypothesis that says those who feel more empathy tend to be more altruistic. Um, that has mixed support, but it's an interesting theory to look into. And then the last one, because of course, we're gonna end on a little bit of a not positive note, is the negative state relief model, 
which basically says that people only help others because it makes us feel less bad. So you're going to hand out money to someone begging on the street because you feel guilty if you just walked past them. So in that case, you've alleviated those negative feelings, you feel better about yourself, and that was your motivation. Or you've watched those um, advertisements on TV where they show you, you know, here are all of these uh, orphaned and abandoned children and they need your help and they have the really sad music. It's all tying into this negative state uh, to try and make you donate to feel better so you feel not so bad about yourself. Um, but all, all sorts of theories and none of them is more or less correct. None of them has a stronger or weaker influence. They all have some support, which is why we've mentioned them.